Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. The Spencer Pride Festival is on for 2020 after a roller coaster six months of debate and controversy surrounding the event. I'm excited to have our only barrier behind us that involves, you know, regulatory, or, you know, approval of a local uh, government agencies. After several injuries and deaths, an iconic quarry from a classic film has been mostly filled in, but the memories linger with Bloomington residents. And payday loans hurt more than just the folks who use them. What we found statewide is it's over $300 million um, in fees have gone to payday lenders from Hoosier households and communities. Ahead, we'll look at predatory lending in Indiana and what state lawmakers can do about it. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. The Spencer Town Council officially approved the Spencer Pride Festival this week, bringing the months-long Owen County Festival dispute to an end. As Mitch Legan reports, both Spencer Pride and local business owners are looking forward to what should be an event-filled summer. For Spencer Pride President Jonathan Balish, the last six months have been difficult, to say the least. It's been, it's been a roller coaster, to be honest with you. Um, it was unexpected to begin with. As the director of an LGBTQ organization in rural Indiana, Bausch says he's dealt with harassment before. But things changed in August when Owen County's Board of Commissioners moved to crack down on Spencer Pride's annual celebration. Okay, so just so everyone here is clear, including myself, because of this petition, you are taking action of some sort. And right now you want to hear voices. I understand that. Correct. The anonymous Facebook group Morals of America pushed the commissioners to keep all special events off county property because they said the Pride Fest was overly sexual. But, you know, there have been things like that on and off here and there. And so um, you kind of hear it and you register it in some way. But, you know, until it really shows up at your doorstep, it's, it's not real. And so, um, you know, it became real for us this past fall. What ensued was a months long back and forth between county officials and residents over festival ordinances that only ended this week. Spencer Pride ended up working with the town council to approve the Pride Fest for 2020, since the county commissioners prohibited all events from the courthouse lawn. We're very excited. It's, it's, uh, it's exciting that we can finally move forward with all of the great plans that we have for our 2020 event. And I'm excited to have our only barrier behind us that involves, you know, regular or, you know, approval of a local uh, government agencies. Along with Balish, many business owners are excited this fight is behind them and the festival's future is no longer in limbo. It was pretty baffling to me, to be honest with you, because like I said, the, the momentum in our downtown area is one of the reasons that we opened up. It's one of the reasons we got excited about being here near the square and to hear that there were government officials that were trying to keep activity off of this area. I didn't understand it. It didn't make sense to me. Festivals are key to making ends meet for business owners on the town square. So many, like Williams, threw their support behind Spencer Pride and the Downtown Event Coalition. The Pride Festival uh, in 2019 was our biggest day since opening, by a long shot. So the amount of people that they bring into the downtown area and that visit these little businesses, it's really important to get that bump, uh, especially for a small, you know, locally owned business. They get you through those hard times, you know. But keeping things off the courthouse lawn wasn't enough for Morals of America. After the county passed its ordinance forbidding festivals on county property, Morals of America released another letter asking the town council to kick the Pride Fest out of downtown Spencer. The open letter said how the downtown businesses don't need it. It's going to impede us as far as people getting into our shops. It's never impeded me. Pride brings in hundreds of people that otherwise wouldn't be down here. So how that 
mindset works, I don't understand because pride does everything it can to try to make Spencer prosper. Morals of America has repeatedly denied requests for interviews because of what they say is a fear of discrimination and persecution. But Balish says that's exactly what they've been doing to him. It's very different to have an anonymous group citing anonymous sources and just making up lies about what we do. It's not really possible to combat that um, in the same way that you actually deal with people who are um, being upfront about you know, their uh, ideology or their beliefs or their perspectives. Morals of America eventually pulled the letter from its Facebook page after business owners made it clear they didn't agree. But by stirring up Spencer Pride in the local business community, Morals of America actually ended up bringing Spencer together. A lot of people in Owen County are, are lacking connection to the community. They're looking for opportunities to meet with other people, to get out and to enjoy things. And obviously festivals and fairs are, are just what they need. Um, and we just, uh, we're still very excited about all the activity. Um, and excited to see what the festivals will be like this summer. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Mitch Legan. We're past the halfway point of this year's legislative session, and now the House and the Senate are looking at each other's legislation before the session ends early next month. Here with us to look at the bills making their way through the State House and what might make it to the governor's desk. State House reporter Brandon Smith. So Brandon, legislation headed to the House lowers the age that juveniles can be sent to the Department of Corrections for crimes. So what exactly would this bill do? Well, you, you said it right there. Uh, it lowers to the age of 12 uh, of the age at which uh, juvenile delinquents could be sent to the Department of Correction. It also expands the list of crimes for which they could be sent to DOC, and it says they can be in DOC for up to six years, which is longer than they've ever been allowed to be there before, because right now they have to be out of DOC at the age of 18. Republicans in the State House gutted a bill that uh, sought to create more accommodations for pregnant employees, which was an employ which was a priority bill for Governor Holcomb. Uh, what is that bill, and where do you see that going? Right. So under uh, right now in Indiana, uh, women in the workplace who are pregnant can't be guaranteed that their employer will offer them accommodations while they're pregnant. Uh, it, it's kind of a patchwork of laws and there's not a lot of guarantees there. So that's what this bill would have done. It would have said, your employer has to work with you to find reasonable accommodations. And the bill listed some examples. Uh, frequent or, uh, or longer, more frequent or longer work breaks, for instance. Getting to, to sit down on the job sometimes. Uh, adjusting your work schedule when possible. But Republicans in the Senate were simply uncomfortable imposing any uh, any sort of requirements or regulations on small businesses and this would have affected businesses with at least 15 employees or more. So they took all of that out and just asked to create a study committee on the topic. We'll see if the House decides to, to install any of those protections back into the bill. I want to get your take on the legislation to allow speed cameras in Indiana highway work zones that died this week. What protections would that have provided for those that do work on the highway? Right, so originally the bill said uh, that the state could install speed cameras in any highway work zone in Indiana, but just to get it out of committee, they shrank that to just a pilot program, four cameras uh, around the state in work zones that would ticket drivers who go at least 11 miles per hour over the speed limit while workers are present. But speed cameras have come up in the Indiana legislature before, and they are quite frankly unpopular with some Republicans, the sort of more libertarian-minded ones who have concerns about, for instance, privacy and things like that. And so it, it couldn't get enough votes on the Senate floor, although its author, John Ford, a Republican from Terre Haute, says he does want to try again next year. All right, Brandon, that's all the time we have this time. Uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Now for the latest, we look at this week's top stories. Heading into next week's primary race in New Hampshire, former South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg and Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders are leading the pack after the Iowa caucus. The strong showing there gave Buttigieg a burst of momentum as he tries to pull away from a crowded field. The race between the early front runners sets up a conflict between the progressives supporting Sanders and moderates supporting Buttigieg. The city of Bloomington is taking another shot at using eminent domain to make room for the proposed 4th Street parking garage. 
The city is planning to appeal two rulings regarding the proposed expansion of the project. A judge ruled the city could not use eminent domain to take realtor Juan Carlos Carasquel's building. The other denied the city's motion to amend its original garage plans. City officials say they will appeal both rulings. Hoosiers gathered from across the state for the first LGBTQ State House Day earlier this week. Statewide organizations provided resources and several lawmakers spoke, recommitting themselves to LGBTQ issues at the State House, including Indiana's first out LGBTQ state legislator. We have to keep fighting. Just because we got marriage equality, don't get me wrong, that is a huge win for our community. But we've got to keep fighting. You can get married over the weekend and be terminated from your job on Monday simply because of who you are and who you love. While the majority of the lawmakers were Democrats, Republican Senator Ron Alting addressed the crowd, celebrating the defeat of a measure that would restrict gender identity on driver's licenses. Needle exchange programs in Indiana could be discontinued as early as summer 2021. This comes as a bill proposed lifting the expiration date on a 2015 initiative, which allowed local health departments to run needle exchange programs died this week. The bill's author says that even though the bill terminating the expiration date of needle exchange programs died, he hopes to find another way to extend those services. The Bloomington Police Department said in its annual public safety report this week that overall crime in the city has dropped by around 5% in 2019, but violent crime spiked around 27% in the same time, while reports of rapes and sexual assaults are up by 55%. BPD officials say that spike might be related to better reporting of such incidents. We will be working with different partners to see what we can do to try to um, raise awareness and, and prevent these crimes from happening to begin with. DCOF also said that the Bloomington Police Department will upgrade body cameras in 2020, so they start recording when officers remove their weapons from their holsters. A Second Amendment sanctuary petition is circulating throughout Indiana. Columbus Mayor Jim Linup says officials in nearby Jennings County signed a non-binding statement to not enforce any new state or federal legislation that might restrict gun ownership. Linup says the Second Amendment is critical to our rights, but local government shouldn't be in a position to pick and choose which laws to enforce. It's not that we don't respect the Second Amendment, we do. But we also respect the Constitution, which says that the courts will tell us what the Constitution means, and it's up to us to enforce the laws as determined by the courts. Linup says anyone could say the same about the income tax code, freedom of speech, or any other rights guaranteed in the Constitution. The city and Bartholomew County issued a joint statement in January of no action on the matter. Indiana University officials say a tool designed to help university staff access student grade point averages was unintentionally made available to the entire IU community. The Indiana Daily Student reported that the GPA calculator tool allowed students, faculty and staff to gain access to records for at least 100,000 current and former students who graduated in 2015 or later, or later. The data breach could be a violation of the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. A Republican state senator decision to install his own bill is likely only temporary. The bill would have given Indiana's attorney general the power to appoint a special prosecutor for crimes local prosecutors choose not to pursue. Supporters say the bill wasn't targeted at, but would impact Marion County's decision to not pursue simple drug possession charges. Marion County officials say the move would only exacerbate tensions between police and minority communities while adding unnecessary cost and pulling police officers off the street. I'm hopeful that the legislature will actually address it as opposed to uh, doing this bill, which is, is just an in run uh, around the true issue and the true challenge, which is how do we deal with possession of marijuana in 2020. Advocates argue the move would create consistency in the state's justice system, and lawmakers plan to introduce revised legislation next year. And Democrats won't have a competitive primary for governor this year after tech entrepreneur Josh Owens dropped out this week. Owens' campaign says he had the signatures needed to qualify for the ballot, but he's dropping out to avoid a divisive primary. 
That leaves former state health commissioner Woody Myers alone in challenging incumbent governor Eric Holcomb. Owen said Myers has the vision for success Indiana deserves. Holcomb finished 2019 with more than $7 million in his campaign war chest, dwarfing the 1900 Myers had at the end of the year. Well, coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Consumer advocates in Indiana are pushing for better rules for payday lenders, but state lawmakers say that could leave vulnerable Hoosiers with no options. And as part of our City Limits series, we look back at the rocky history of a Bloomington landmark made famous on film. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU News Team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU News Team is where you are and telling your story. In a time of change, where can you find in-depth reporting and thoughtful analysis? Washington Week on PBS. Join moderator Robert Costa. When I was at the Capitol this week, I encountered the same... And a panel of award-winning journalists. You're seeing a divided nation and you're seeing... For insights and perspective. Tonight there was a key development in the You won't find anywhere else. What a week. Washington Week. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. In 2018, rumors started swirling that crews had filled in the iconic Sanders Quarry featured in 1979's Breaking Away. But without official word from the company that owns the quarry, Tom Trent asked City Limits to find out what was going on. As George Hale reports, there have been issues with people trespassing onto nearby residents' property and also getting hurt at the quarry. Laura Stolberg didn't rush into building her dream home south of Bloomington. She had the perfect plot of land and wanted to make sure the house capitalized on the natural surroundings. After years of drafting her own designs, she had it figured out, and construction crews broke ground. And we couldn't get construction trucks in and out the street because there were so many kids parked up and down the street. Um, so we started chasing them off and trying to get them to go elsewhere um, which they were not very happy about, but they just kept coming. The destination is a turquoise pool dug deep into the earth about a quarter of a mile past Stolberg's house. It's one of dozens of limestone quarries scattered across southern Indiana, but this one is famous from breaking away. You know, I think you're just afraid of those college guys. Oh, and you're not, right, Mike? The only thing I'm afraid of is wasting the rest of my life with you guys. I grew up here. Um, I'm from Bloomington, so... Of course, I saw the movie, and uh, I do understand uh, the appeal, but it got to the point where um, there would be 300 people back there uh, on a given weekend. Uh, it's, it's just inherently dangerous with all of the rocks, and people were jumping from rooftop, which is an 80-foot drop, somewhere, something like that. Videos like this one posted on social media only drew more people. Someone set up a Facebook page for the quarry, and people would post jumping challenges. Neighbors saw more than one person hauled away by ambulance. Care flight was dispatched on at least one occasion, and several people have died since breaking away was released. I'm running out of teeth! Oh, sh <laughs> And it wasn't necessarily the huge slabs of stone that were injuring people. Dr. Louis Profeta co-authored a study about injuries and deaths at Bloomington area quarries. I think all of them except for one came from Sanders Quarry. The velocity in which these people were hitting the water at that point was like hitting concrete. And so these people were getting critically injured from that jump. Profeta did his research about three decades ago, and he says the solution was simple back then. Get rid of the famous rooftop ledge. I took office in 2015 and I was uh, dealing with uh, a lot of parking complaints more than problems that happened at the quarry. They would ask people as they were walking through where's the 
breaking away quarry, the rooftop. So a lot of people wanted to come and part of their college experience or from watching the movie. Neighbors posted no trespassing signs, many installed cameras, and they had the sheriff on speed dial. Quarry operators hired off-duty officers to patrol the area and ticket trespassers. And in 2016, the operators were bulldozing trees and other debris toward the highest ledge of the quarry. And now, about two-thirds of the quarry is filled in. Swain has complicated feelings about the limestone company's decision to partially fill the iconic quarry. Like so many others who grew up in Monroe County, he swam in it when he was young. To this day, if I was there, and I'd still have the urge to take a jump myself. <laughs> and uh, uh, that opportunity is no longer there. But Stolberg finally feels like she can enjoy the serenity of her new home. I opened the doors because it's so nice out today, but I was hoping maybe we'd hear something. But it's quiet right now. The no parking signs are still up, and occasionally someone will pull up and wander back to the quarry. But she's no longer second-guessing herself about whether it was the right decision to build here. For Indiana News Desk, I'm George Hale. Payday loans drain hundreds of millions of dollars in fees from the pockets of Hoosiers. Some argue, some argue they're predatory, while others say they're the only option available to the most vulnerable people in the state. As Tyler Lake reports, some Hoosiers are learning the payday loan cycle is tough to escape. He just got his back pay. Did he? he got That's awesome. Pay. Ever since a friend showed Stephen Bramer how to get the most help out of the Veterans Affairs Administration, he's been returning the favor by helping other vets a lot of other vets. Hundreds, maybe thousands, it's, it's a lot. I mean, it's amazing how many veterans are out there. After returning from Iraq, it took years for Bramer to get back on his feet, and spending the past few years dedicating himself to helping vets has been part of the process. What I do is I kind of just guide them through the process. So uh, I help homeless veterans, take them to their appointments sometimes, you know, whatever I could do to help. Then after spending tens of thousands of dollars on a custody battle, he was forced to enter another tough to navigate system. The second year in, um, we just couldn't pay the lawyer. It just got too much. See, he was ready to drop us and it was my only option. So to keep his lawyer, he got a small payday loan. I was thinking at the time, I could do that. You know, I'll get the lawyer, then I'll pay that and it'll be fine. Well, then the next month comes and you realize, oh, I'm $2,000 short now and I'm only getting 3800 So, yeah, that's where it kind of kicked in, you know, where you realize that that wasn't a very good option. It's an option that thousands of often the most vulnerable Hoosiers have had to turn to. They're going to go into these stores and they're going to take out what might seem at the time to be something that's going to help them bridge a gap, but what's going to put them into a cycle of debt that's going to continue to charge them this high cost rate of 391% that they can't afford. While payday loans don't have traditional finance rates, fees can add up quickly and they can top out at the equivalent of 391% annually. Indiana has a loan sharking law that caps percentage rates and fees at the equivalent of 72 percent APR, but payday lenders got an exemption from state lawmakers back in 2002. State Senator Andy Zay says those high interest rate numbers can be misleading. When you're putting in statute, you're putting in a number that maybe sounds higher than it actually is. And the finance companies, banks, credit unions, whatever, most of them lend significantly below that because it's the marketplace that's driving it. And even if those loans don't always go as high as 391 percent, business has been good. Sixty percent of Hoosiers take out another payday loan on the same day that they pay theirs off. We know that by a month out from the payday loan, it's about 80 percent have taken out another payday loan. That's a cycle of debt that's tough to escape, but it's extremely lucrative for payday lenders. What we found statewide is it's over $300 million um, from in fees have gone to payday lenders from Hoosier households and communities. That $300 million is just from the last five years, and all that money comes from the poorest Hoosiers. The majority are making less than $20,000 a year. And if you look at where storefronts are located, that isn't a coincidence. We see that they are disproportionately in areas um, that are predominantly communities of color and then also um, lower income neighborhoods. And while Bramer says the charges for these loans are too high, it's not the lenders he blames. The payday loan places are going to try to get as much as they can. You know, I mean, that's just how business is. But it's up to the lawmakers to regulate it for them, you know, for us, to protect us. But some state lawmakers say aggressively curbing interest rates will leave many in the state with no place to go. 
And if you restrict it down to a level where um, these um, banks, finance institutions can't com- can't compete in these neighborhoods, they will move out, and then people simply won't have access to any credit. And you know that that's getting down to hurting the poorest of the poor. And that's something Bramer and Zay agree on. Last year, I was listening to what some of the senators said. They said there's people that need this, and I agree with them that people do need this, but not to put them in a worse position. He says he thinks the lenders can still make massive profits without trapping people in endless cycles of debt. But he says only lawmakers can make that happen. I mean, they have the power to fix this, and so it's either fix it or make it worse. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Tyler Lake. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you.